right. Hi, everybody. I know we're on just a few minutes or well, I guess we're right on time. I'm just going to give one or two minutes to let people join watching. Hi, everybody. I know we're on just a few minutes, or well, I guess we're right on time. I'm just going to get. All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the 39th annual Public Interest Environmental Law Conference. My name is Michelle, and I'm a 1L content representative for Land Air Water. Today, we are live streaming this panel onto our YouTube channel. Um, there is a chat function on the side of the stream. Feel free to ask questions for the panelists. All the panelists will give their presentation and then there will be a short Q&A section at the end. I will also be adding a link in the chat to a Google document. Um, the Google doc has information for any legal professionals looking to get CLE credit for this panel. Also our alumni board, Friends of Land Air Water, um, who help to provide stipend for students doing unpaid public interest environmental law internships over the summer are asking for donations if you would like to provide one, there will be information on that in the Google document link as well. And again, that's just going to be in the side chat function. Um, today's panel is titled a Coexistence with Carnivores, Learning to Share Landscapes with Our Wild Neighbors. Presenting the panel, we have Samantha Bruger from Wild Earth Guardians, Haley Stewart from the Humane Society of the United States, and Dr. Sirsti Kamal from the Def um, Defenders of Wildlife. And without further ado, panelists, I will hand it over to you all. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us today here. Um, on behalf of the panelists, I would like to welcome you to this panel discussion on coexistence and specifically coexistence with carnivores. Um, the three panelists, as Michelle mentioned, uh, are from three organizations. So Samantha is from Wild Earth Guardians, Haley from Humane Society of the United States, and I am with Defenders of Wildlife. The three of our organizations are also part of the Oregon Wildlife Coalition, which is a coalition of nine conservation organizations working in Oregon. I will um, start by mentioning uh, what we mean by coexistence. So coexistence for us is a philosophy where humans and wildlife can share a landscape in a way that both communities can benefit from it. Uh, for carnivores, that means building tolerance in uh, human communities towards them and slowly, gradually moving towards acceptance through changed behavior and changed perspectives. So that's largely what we will be talking about today, but we'll present different perspectives on this issue. And um, so with that, let's get started with a very brief round of introductions. Um, I'll go first. Uh, my name is Trishti Kamal. I'm the senior Northwest representative with Defenders of Wildlife. My pronouns are she and her. Um, I'm based out of Portland, Oregon, and Defenders works primarily on imperiled and native species and protecting their habitats as well. And um, so today I will focus on the ecological perspectives on a coexistence and why we need to protect certain species to protect the ecological services they provide. And with that, I'll hand it over to Haley. Thanks so much, Trishti. Um, so my name is Haley Stewart. I'm a wildlife protection manager with the Humane Society of the United States. Uh, I primarily work on native carnivore protection for the HSUS, and I focus mainly on state level policy. I manage uh, mountain lion protection. I also work on bears, sometimes wolves, you name it. If it's a native carnivore, I probably work on it. Um, and today I'm going to be discussing the role of state management of carnivores um, and how current policies can cause challenges for coexistence. Um, primarily by limiting options for non-lethal conflict response, as well as disrupting carnivore populations, which can then lead to um, increased conflicts with native carnivores. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Samantha. Hi, I'm Samantha Bruger. I am the wildlife coexistence campaigner for Wild Earth Guardians. Um, I mostly work on carnivore coexistence um, in the 11 westernmost states, and then I also work on some federal policy as well. Um, so, and I will actually start us off. So if everyone's okay, I can start diving into the presentation and 
um, pass it along. I do want to mention that Wild Earth Guardians is a 501c3 organization. And Wild Earth Guardians actually works on protecting wild places, wildlife, um, wild rivers, and uh, the health of the American West. So there's my guardian spiel. You can check us out at wildearthguardians.org. And I will go into my presentation. Okay, so um, as I had mentioned, I'll be talking a little bit about wildlife services today. Um, wildlife services is a, a very interesting federal program, and I think there are a lot of challenges with this program that I'll be highlighting in the following slides. Um, but there's also some opportunities, and a lot of those different types of opportunities will also be highlighted by my co-panelists as they uh, walk through their presentations too. Um, so Wildlife Services is a federally funded wildlife killing program. Every year they kill over a million animals um, in the United States and those are just native wildlife species that does not include invasive species. Um, so in 2019 they killed 1.3 million wild animals um, and Wildlife Services is actually housed in the United States Department of Agriculture. Um, which means that it's often addressing wildlife conflict through the lens of um, agribusiness. A um, little bit of background, uh, wildlife services originally started out as animal damage control. Um, they were institutionalized through the Animal Damage Control Act in the 1930s. Um, however, today they have expanded. They are now known as the Misnomer Wildlife Services. Um, they operate an, on a very robust federal budget of $172 million. Um, and what they do is they try to um, work on perceived threats and sometimes real threats uh, for damage to crops and or livestock. Um, a lot of this work ends up taking a lethal approach to this or killing animals, and we certainly hope as we move forward, uh, they can embrace some more non-lethal work, and we'll talk about that a little more. Um, I wanted to give you kind of a big picture of how many animals they're killing in each state in the West. So these are the 11 Western states that I work in, um, and you can just see these numbers are, are pretty large, um, and that includes cougars, bears, wolves. Um, they do kill grizzlies from time to time with livestock conflict. Um, and then prairie dogs, uh, we've got uh, all kinds of different animals that are getting uh, killed by wildlife services, raptors, a um, little bit of everything. Um, wildlife services tends to prefer or often start first with um, killing animals rather than implementing technical assistance or implementing kind of proven non-lethals for conflicts. Um, and for the purpose of this, we're mainly going to be talking about the types of conflicts that wildlife services addresses. Um, we'll talk more about other conflicts as uh, the other panelists present too. Um, but wildlife services, again, they, they kill over a million animals. Um, these are some of the methods that they use and uh, I'll walk through briefly each one. Um, trapping Wildlife Services does trap. Um, they will use foothold or body grip or suitcase traps. Um, suitcase traps are often used on beaver um, or near riparian animals. Uh, rip, yeah, riparian areas with animals. <laughs> um, and so they will do that if beaver are around a timber operation or if beaver are building a dam around a, a livestock uh, watering area. That kind of stuff um, would be an example of where they would use traps for beavers. Uh, next airs are pretty popular with them in some areas for coyotes. Um, sometimes these are set out preemptively and uh, used to, to kill coyotes in the area of maybe like a sheep growing operation. Um, firearms, I, I mean that's their, their most frequently used tools. Um, they will kill any animal that's held maybe in a foothold trap um, with a firearm. Um, another one is aerial gunning. This one um, is really frustrating to me because at the cost of over $800 an hour, and we have to remember this is a federally funded program, um, wildlife services will actually take to the sky in a fixed winged aircraft or a helicopter and run down carnivores until they're exhausted and they can take an easy shot 
and then kill that carnivore. Um, we often see this with wolves and coyotes. And then uh, lastly, uh, Wildlife Services does you use different poisons. And this can include things like sodium cyanide, which we will talk about a little bit more, um, but also different pesticides and rodenticides um, and uh, compound 1080, which is another uh, pretty terrible poison that they put in livestock collars. Um, so if a coyote does uh, bite um, the neck of a livestock, they are poisoned with uh, compound 1080 um, through these collars. So I touched on this, the, the sodium cyanide M44s are uh, really kind of spring-loaded um, ejector devices. And they, this graphic is really fabulous in how it shows exactly how it works. Um, you can see from the photo here that uh, sodium cyanide really looks like, and let me move our screen. I'm realizing as I'm sharing, hopefully you can see the whole thing. Um, yeah, so they look kind of like sprinkler heads. And it's concerning in that wildlife services can actually use all of these methods on public lands. Um, so around grazing allotments in the Forest Service, around grazing on BLM lands, on lands that we all like to use and recreate on, or even, you know, hunt <laughs> in an ethical way on, um, these methods can be deployed. So with M44s, they are totally indiscriminate. Um, they look like a sprinkler head and they're often baited, which attracts both target and non-target species. Um, these things have accidentally poisoned a lot of different animals, including a lot of domestic dogs. If you think you're taking your dog out uh, for an adventure to explore, they would be attracted to the same thing. Um, in 2017, I, a boy was actually poisoned by one of these devices in Idaho. And we've been working pretty hard to try to get federal legislation passed that would ban these federally. Within the state of Oregon, they are banned, um, but we would really like to see a federal ban. Um, another way would be through an EPA petition. Uh, Trump had reauthorized uh, the use of these M44s during uh, his time as president. And there's potential for maybe petitioning uh, the new administration to unauthorize uh, M44s just because they are so dangerous. Um, I wanted to get a little bit behind the why Wildlife Services is doing this and some of the reasons we see as far as uh, their reporting. As we go through, we submit a lot of different public uh, information requests. And through that, we can see the kind of conflicts that Wildlife Services is addressing and kind of the why behind uh, why they're killing animals. Um, and so I'll, I'll go through cougars and uh, wolves and bears. And there are a lot of other animals, so know that there are more, but we'll use these as uh, three examples today. Um, so Cougars are often killed um, in response to uh, perhaps a, a cougar attacking a, a livestock or a domestic animal, but they're also targeted just for being around because uh, just for being around because they're a perceived public safety threat, whether real or not. Um, and they are also killed even for being around timber operations. Wildlife services will, will kill a, a cougar, if you will, for just being in the woods. Um, so there's uh, different justifications that just don't make sense there. Um, with wolves and coyotes, um, sometimes they even kill them preemptively. And that's where we'll see January, February, a um, little bit of into early March, they'll do aerial gunning. And they do that in a way to try to clear the landscape of carnivores uh, prior to releasing out cows and sheep um, onto these larger grazing allotments. So, um, Again, it's, it's not scientifically proven to work, but it's the way it's been done since the 1930s. So um, we see this kind of cycle perpetuating in a way that, again, um, does not make sense. And then uh, bears are actually killed for timber damage as well. Um, bears like to scratch up on trees. So if it's a timber operation here in Oregon and there are bears in the area, uh, that are doing their normal bear things, uh, wildlife services will respond and kill those bears. And like I mentioned, they do kill uh, grizzlies from time to time uh, in response to livestock conflicts. Um, I have this map up with all of these fascinating little black dots um, just to show you 
um, the wildlife services contracts as of 2018 that exist in Oregon. Um, I thought it was important for everyone to understand that wildlife services contracts with everyone from, let's say, a resort outside of Bend um, to manage maybe voles or um, raccoons or something like that. Um, and they can contract all the way up to state level um, with different state agencies. Um, they contract with different counties, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a second. Um, and some of those counties that are in more rural areas, uh, they contract also just to do this kind of preventative coyote killing uh, too. So I wanted to give a spotlight um, in Lane County, which is where we would usually be having this conference in person. Um, but we did some records requests within Lane County after we heard through the grapevine about a rumor that uh, Wildlife Services was killing feral cats at landfills. Um, and that turned out to not be the case. They were trapping and relocating the cats. But what we did see was that Wildlife Services had actually killed a few black bears in response to trash conflict at these rural refuse sites. And that's what you are seeing um, in this slide is kind of these big dumpsters set up in kind of rural Lane County um, in the woods, um, unprotected. There's no fencing around them or anything like that. And every once in a while, a bear wanders in and you can see the doors are wide open and uh, can get a snack. And Wildlife Services was actually going in and, and killing these bears rather than implementing preventative things that are uh, pretty easily implementable with waste management practices. So we were actually able to work with uh, Lane County Waste Management, um, provide them with technical assistance um, from, uh, gosh, I'm gonna lose, lose my person who helped me now, um, will not come to my mind. Um, but with a Karulian Bear Dog program, we connected them um, with that program. We also were able to provide them um, some different toolkits that we have and uh, work with former county commissioner, uh, Pete Sorensen, and really trying to make the contracts with wildlife services more friendly towards wildlife and more coexistence oriented. Um, and the last thing that we do, I wanna kind of show you the opportunities here in this last slide of mine, um, that we are working to, to, again, create an environment of coexistence um, so um, in three different ways, we can touch on a, an example of each. Um, every so often, <laughs> Wildlife Services does environmental assessments or environmental impact studies on different states. Um, just recently, they, they gave us a three of these all in a short period of time um, for Oregon. For Oregon, it was a full environmental impact studies and it's entering the, the first phase, which is scoping of that process. And then in Washington, they're doing an environmental assessment. And in Montana, they are doing an, an environmental assessment. So what Guardians does is we work with our, our coalition of folks on the ground to get together these really robust comments um, that get all of the science and details and documents into the record through this process. And then uh, set us up in a way that we can litigate if necessary, if all of the issues have not been uh, fully considered. Um, another thing that we do is look at federal funding and uh, federal budget solutions. Um, this was done pretty successfully by uh, defenders and some other groups and, and Sristi's on here um, to secure $1.38 million uh, just towards non-lethal uh, work done by wildlife services. Um, what we're starting to see is because wildlife services is so institutionalized that the best route to, to to coexistence really is not to abolish them, but to reform the agency itself. It's already being used to solve conflicts. So how can we fund them in such a way that they are empowered to do that more often? <laughs> and then on the flip side of that with legislation and policy, how can we limit the killing that they're doing? Um, how do we ban M44s at the federal level? in a way that we start reining in kind of the more egregious things that wildlife services does. Um, so it's really a multi-tiered approach. Um, and on, with Guardians, we often get to play the left flank, which is really fun. Um, and I really push for progressive change. And uh, we're definitely hoping to see that now with the new administration and office. And with that, I will hand it over to Haley.
in just one second. Can you see my screen okay? Do you see the slides? All right. I'm not seeing the slides. I think you just need to um, hit the play presentation mode for the slideshow and it should work. We can see the your PowerPoint from the side. Okay, I had it up. One sec. Haley, do you want me to click through it for you? Yeah, I'm just, I, I can play the, I can show the slides, but then um, I can't see Zoom to like click through it. Okay, I will click, I will click through you. Okay. Cool. Thanks so much, Samantha. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. Um, so thank you all so much for tuning in today. Um, as I mentioned before, my name is Haley Stewart. I'm a program manager. I work on wildlife protection for the Humane Society of the United States. Um, and just to give you some background on HSUS, you know, we work across the country to create a humane and sustainable world for all animals, um, and that includes wildlife. And so I work on native carnivore protection for the HSUS, and I primarily focus on state level policy. And you can find more about HSUS at humanesociety.org. So today I'll be discussing the role of state management of carnivores and how current policies can cause challenges for coexistence. And I'm gonna close with some recommendations where state management may be improved so that we can better coexist with carnivores. And my talk today is going to cover state policies in the Pacific Northwest, but please do feel free to reach out to me if you have questions about carnivores in other states. So traditionally, uh, state wildlife agencies manage native carnivores for the purposes of allowing trophy hunting opportunities, as well as for predator control. And to provide some context to you that HSUS refers to the recreational hunting of native carnivores as trophy hunting because the practice is done primarily um, for trophy or for bragging rights. And the story often told is that wildlife agencies need to employ heavy handed lethal management of native carnivores to reduce conflicts with humans, pets and livestock uh, or to protect prey populations. Um, or because if we don't kill them, their populations are just gonna explode. But we know from extensive research that these myths typically don't hold up against scientific scrutiny. And for this discussion today, I'll be focusing on issues and solutions surrounding those first two myths pertaining to reducing conflicts with humans, pets, and livestock. Next slide. So I first wanna push back against the concept that we need hunting of carnivores to reduce conflicts. Media outlets and even wildlife agencies continue to perpetuate the myth that native carnivores pose a significant threat to humans and pet safety. Um, and there's something that we need to fear. But attacks on humans from wild carnivores are extraordinarily rare in the US and they're typically caused by provocation. A person is much more likely to die from a lightning strike, bee sting, or even a vehicle collision with deer than from native carnivores. And the chances of even just seeing a native carnivore, like a mountain lion, um, or as we call them in the Pacific Northwest, cougars, just seeing one is incredibly rare, even for people who live in cougar country. 
And that's because native carnivores actively try to avoid humans and human communities. Also, there are plenty of tools and strategies that people can adopt to prevent conflicts from happening in the first place. Um, for example, you know, not feeding prey species like deer near homes or using wildlife proof trash cans. Next slide. So the other myth is that carnivores kill a large number of livestock, uh, but we know from state and federal data that these numbers pale in comparison to other causes of unwanted mortality. So for example, the Humane Society of the United States, we recently published three reports which present our analysis of the US Department of Agriculture's data sets for cattle and sheep deaths from native carnivores. And according to the USDA, all native carnivores, domestic dogs, and other predating animals put together killed less than 1% of the US cattle inventory and about 4% of the sheep inventory nationwide. Um, in fact, the USDA data, USDA data show that farmers and ranchers lose nine times more cattle and sheep to things like health, weather, and birthing problems than to all native carnivores and domestic dogs combined. Now, obviously there are more cattle and uh, sheep and carnivores in some states than in others, but the data show that even in states with large carnivores like Oregon and Washington, the predation rates are still extremely low, typically around that 1% or less of unwanted and cattle, cattle and sheep losses. And the same holds true in the Great Lakes states um, livestock predation rates from gray wolves there are extremely low, sometimes even in the single digits, yet the, these states are currently rushing to open up hunts on wolves now that the species has been federally delisted, and they, uh, they, they say that livestock predation, um, that's one of their primary justifications for doing so. Next slide. So we know that native carnivore conflicts with humans, pets, and livestock are relatively rare, uh, but they do still happen. And state wildlife agencies have established policies that generally guide management actions for dealing with conflicts. And by and large, wildlife agencies use trophy hunting and trapping of native carnivores as their primary quote unquote tool in the toolbox to manage conflicts with these animals. But Research has continued to push back against this tradition of wildlife management, demonstrating that not only is lethal indiscriminate management of carnivores not effective for reducing conflicts, it can actually lead to increased conflicts with these animals. Um, just for an example, cougar hunters, they often end up killing adult territorial males, which leads to an influx of young males uh, buying for his territory and the females that he shared it with. And this influx of young cougars can actually result in more conflicts because they're inexperienced at hunting and they're more likely to seek easy prey like livestock. And according to research in Washington, heavy hunting of resident adult mountain lions in one year increased the odds of complaints and livestock losses in the following year by 150 to 340 percent. Now without trophy hunting, especially in areas with livestock, large carnivores are able to create long lasting stable communities in these areas, acting as sort of a fence and keeping those young animals away. Yet this concept of needing recreational hunting and trapping of carnivores to deal with conflicts, it still persists and it often drives high levels of killing. Um, for example, Idaho is currently proposing to eliminate all cougar hunting quotas statewide with conflict reduction as one of their primary justifications. Um, and here in Oregon, we have one of the highest cougar quotas in the country, allowing up to 900 cats to be killed year round out of an estimated 3,500 mature aged cats. So that's nearly 30% of that mature population or double what researchers believe is a sustainable hunting quota. And in Washington, the state wildlife agency um, actually increased the cougar quota or the harvest limit as they refer to it by nearly 50% just last year. And the proposal to increase the quota was messaged to the public as an attempt to respond to public fears regarding conflicts with these cats. 
despite no reliable evidence that conflicts are actually increasing in Washington, and despite the agency's own biologists stating that increased hunting won't address conflicts. And after acknowledging that the increased hunting of cougars wouldn't address conflicts, the Washington Fish and Wildlife Commission instead voted to approve the increased quota simply to provide more hunting opportunity. Next slide. Now turning to wolves, um, to give you an example, throughout much of their range in the US, they're routinely subjected to state sanctioned trophy hunting and trapping seasons. In, Wash in Wyoming, they consider 83% of the state as a predator zone. Um, in those areas, trophy hunters and trappers can employ really cruel methods to kill or capture wolves with zero restraint. Um, another example uh, from Idaho, they no longer limit the number of wolves that can be killed in the state. They don't have a quota. Um, and they even allow hunters to kill multiple wolves, including at the den in springtime when whole families are vulnerable. Um, there was actually a, a bill recently drafted in Idaho, HB 238, which seeks to reclassify wolves as a predator species, which would lead to even more killing of these animals. Um, and in Montana, the legislature there is currently considering a slew of bills um, similarly that would allow for increased trophy hunting and trapping of wolves. Um, and just for a brief example from the Great Lakes State, um, some of you may have heard Wisconsin just kicked off their first wolf hunt last week um, since, the, since wolves were federally delisted. It closed three days later on Wednesday with hunters killing 216 wolves or 21% of the minimum population count um, and 80% above the quota of 119 wolves. Next slide. So for an example um, from black bears, just last year, the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife considered a proposal to allow black bear hunting along the wild and scenic section of the Rogue River. And the concept was originally couched as an attempt to reduce bear conflicts with recreators along the Rogue by increasing hunting opportunities while calling bears that cause problems. But even the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife regional biologist acknowledged that a hunt in the area would not fix the problem because indiscriminately killing carnivores doesn't target the bears that might be causing problems. And because they're going to continue to have problems with bears if they don't address actual conflicts. Um, so the conflicts that they are having are related to attractants such as human food drawing bears into cap, camp and raft sites. So after intense public backlash, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife pulled the proposal for consideration. Um, and we see this as a really clear example of, human of a human caused problem that could have humane human led solutions, but the agency wanted to respond to conflicts by allowing trophy hunting. Um, and sadly in an area that's appreciated by recreators and wildlife watchers um, from around the world. Next slide. So in addition to trophy hunting, state agencies may also use indiscriminate predator control um, as a conflict response tool as Samantha has already gone into detail. Um, so from a state level here in Oregon, um, the Fish and Wildlife Department has created regional target areas amounting to hundreds of acres where cougars are randomly culled for so-called purposes of conflict reduction, as well as to boost prey populations. In these target areas, um, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife staff, USDA Wildlife Service agents, and other volunteer agents work to reduce the local cougar population. And they can kill cougars of any age, any sex, um, until a predetermined quota is filled, and that quota is separate from the trophy hunting quota. Um, hunters are also allowed to use traps as well as dogs to find and chase cougars. And these are practices that are banned in Oregon and Washington, but um, state and federal employees and volunteer agents are exempt from those prohibitions. So in 2016 to 2019, the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife established a target area in Douglas County 
where 30 cougars were killed each year to reduce livestock damage and public safety conflicts. Um, and over the years, the agency has spent millions of dollars on operating these target areas with little to no results showing them to be effective. Um, additionally, wildlife biologists reviewing a 17 year data set that involved Michigan wolves and livestock losses discovered that the lethal removal of wolves for livestock production reason reasons on one farm actually increased future predation on their neighbor's livestock. And in 2018, researchers published an analysis of more than 140 predator control studies and found that removing carnivores generally had little effect on reducing conflicts. And in some cases, conflicts are actually increased. Next slide. In addition to uh, the wildlife agency policies and regulations that can perpetuate lethal management of carnivores, um, as their primary tool to deal with conflicts, states may also have statutes that in a way may tie an agency's hands in how they're allowed to respond to conflicts, um, or they may limit the regulations they can implement. So for example, in Oregon, state statute allows a person to kill a cougar or bear that poses a threat to human safety. Now that's a really um, e extremely common law. Um, most states have that on the books, if not all. But Oregon's um, goes on to define human safety as the loss of wariness of humans displayed through repeated sightings of the animal during the day near a permanent structure, a permanent corral or mobile dwelling used by humans at an agricultural, timber management, ranching, or construction site. So what the law basically says in essence is that a person can kill a cougar or a bear just for being seen near a building. And the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife essentially interprets this to mean that they can't require anyone to try non-lethal management for these species prior to taking the lethal approach. And as Shristi will discuss in just a bit, there's another Oregon statute, ORS 496, which actually prohibits the Fish and Wildlife Commission from regulating species classified as predatory. Um, so that includes coyotes and even on private lands, beavers. And so similarly to cougars and bears, the agency is really prohibited from trying to implement sound wildlife management and conflict response regulations for these species. Um, they're even prohibited from, uh, uh, from implementing or from, from protecting these animals from really cruel or wasteful practices like killing contests. Um, and so there's a bill actually in the Oregon legislature HB 2728 to prohibit uh, coyote killing contests because the commission isn't able to regulate that. So another example comes from Washington where hunting black bears, cougars, and bobcats with dogs is unlawful. However, if you look at the relevant statute, it also includes uh, this clause that you see on the screen, which states that a wide range of people are actually not prohibited from hunting these animals with dogs. Um, while acting in their official capacity for protecting livestock, domestic animals, private property, or public safety. And unfortunately, the Sheriff of Klickitat County, Washington, many of you may have seen this in the news, he's taken it um, to mean that he has the authority to establish a wildlife hound hunting posse. So the, that posse is made up of volunteer houndsmen. They're called upon to respond to any detection of a cougar in the area. So if someone thinks that they saw or even heard a cougar, a houndsman is called out um, to track down and kill that cougar. Um, based on incident reports we've received through public records requests, the majority of calls have resulted in no cougars being killed because the hunter's dogs were not able to pick up a scent, um, which suggest, suggests that a cougar was never even there in the first place. Um, but dozens of cougars have been killed by this posse since they formed in 2019. Um, we believe that this is a huge abuse of power. It oversteps sound wildlife management, and it's really only just creating unnecessary public fear while pretend, potentially exacerbating conflicts with cougars and making the situation worse. Um, but unfortunately, the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife Wildlife believes that they don't have the authority to stop the sheriff because of this existing statute. 
So working towards non-lethal conflict prevention and carnivore coexistence um, it admittedly can feel like an uphill battle. Oftentimes we do find ourselves working with a wide range of stakeholders though, including ranchers who support coexistence and want to see changes in their own communities as well as across the entire state. Um, and there's a number of areas that need improvement, meaning that there's a number of ways for anyone who's interested in, the, is, in this issue to uh, get involved and lend a hand. Um, and I'm just gonna run through some of what I see as, as areas for improvement. I'm sure there are a lot more, um, but these are just kind of, I'm gonna give you four that I really think are, are um, the most important in my eyes. So the first would be um, state wildlife agencies taking a more active approach in changing the narrative to support coexistence and um, actually implementing strategies that holistically address conflicts especially prioritizing non-lethals. So this would require the agency to provide ongoing public education and outreach um, and having actual conversations with people rather than just you know, posting something on their website. It also means prioritizing a coexistence message in, the, in media statements, um, which reach a broad audience. And I know that some agencies have really tried to do that and actually provide recommendations for how people can coexist with native carnivores. So that's great, but I still think we have a long way to go. Um, the second is there needs to be greater funding and support for coexistence strategies and non-lethal methods that prevent conflicts from happening in the first place. And this includes funding for staff who can be adequately trained and in communities to provide education and support, um, as well as appropriately responding to conflicts that do occur. So for example, the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, they actually have regional conflict specialists to help respond to conflicts as well as provide public education. Um, but there's only a handful of, of these conflict specialists in the state, meaning that the agency does often rely on county authorities to respond to conflicts. Um, so increased funding, that, that also includes funding for non-lethal tools and staff who can teach and support ranchers and other livestock growers who are interested in using these tools. Um, the USDA data that uh, HSUS analyzed shows that only about 20% of cattle operations um, use non-lethal methods to protect their livestock in Washington and about 23% use them in Oregon. So we've got a long way to go. Uh, working with livestock growers can actually um, increase the use and, and implementation of effective non-lethal methods, which is vital for preventing conflicts and, um, and increasing coexistence. All right, next slide. So third, um, you know, we really need legislators who can help improve wildlife statutes that make coexistence um, challenging or prevent state wildlife agencies from creating regulations that could be beneficial to both people and wildlife. The statutes that I provided uh, today from Oregon and Washington, those are just Washington, those are just some of the few statutes um, that are on the books in the Pacific Northwest. They, there's, there are statutes like that around the country. Um, and those really hamper our efforts to coexist with these carnivores. So we need to be working with legislature, legislatures to improve those statutes um, and change things so that we can um, work proactively on these issues. Um, and then fourth, um, you know, until there's an end to trophy hunting of native carnivores, state agencies really need to rethink carnivore hunting policies to prevent overexploitation and social disruption of these species. Um, agency biologists often recognize that indiscriminate killing of native carnivores through hunting doesn't actually address conflicts or provide long-term solutions. Um, unfortunately, management plans and hunting proposals, they often fall short of really acknowledging the latest research on this issue um, and, and using that to inform sound management. And so groups like HSUS, we're gonna continue press, pressing those agencies to do this through regulation setting processes. Um, so now I'm gonna hand it over to Shrishti. Thank you so much, Haley. And I'm going to try sharing my screen. Um, let me know if that does not work for some reason. 
Um, is that working? Perfect. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, I'm taking over after Haley and thank you everyone and um, hello again. So um, you already heard some interesting perspective from um, Haley and Samantha on coexistence, mainly the need for policy and institutional reforms and for the basic need to treat wildlife in a more humane manner. So in my part of the presentation, I will uh, focus on Oregon and what Oregon is doing or conversely not doing uh, to promote coexistence with two spe specific species and use them as an example to look um, into the role of coexistence in um, promoting um, ecological services in the state. So uh, let's start with the first uh, factor. So let me try. There we go. Um, so the first uh, ecological factor I would focus on is habitat connectivity. And for that, I will use wolves as an example. Um, why wolves? Because uh, wolves are, as we know, pack animals and they tend to roam wide ranges. So they have huge wide range, home ranges. Um, it is not uncommon for a wolf to cover 30 miles in a day. And so they need places to roam and they need ecological corridors to disperse. For example, from Eastern Oregon towards Western Oregon or from Oregon to California. So to, for them to be able to disperse, there needs to be habitat connectivity. So protecting wolves would mean protecting their habitat and protecting their habitat would mean protecting our forests, streams on which several other species depend on. Um, and um, so just to highlight the two photos, the one on the top and the bottom left are from our um, sort of citizen science project that we run out of Mount Hood National Forest. So those are wolves of the White River Pack um, that live on Warm Spring Reservation and just an hour away from Portland. Um, so I would like to drive home the point of habitat connectivity using some exciting news uh, as examples. Uh, in December of 2020, um, we had a wolf from Emily Pack, which is close to La Grande, so Eastern Oregon, make it all the way to California. Um, and then uh, as recent as last month, which is February of 2021, we had OR93. Um, he was from the White River Pack, uh, which is the one that's close to Mount Hood. And he made it all the way to California as well. Um, and this is the first time a wolf from the western part of the state has actually made it to California. All wolves that have gone so far from Oregon to California have been from the eastern side, including the very famous OR7 AKA journey. So um, this just shows that the western side of our state, which is the most populated area of the state, um, still has habitat connectivity that the wolf is able to make his way down. So this is just an interesting news and just highlights how important uh, habitat connectivity is for wolves to be able to disperse. Um, so before I sort of deep dive into coexistence issues with wolves in Oregon, let's look at quick stats on Oregon wolves. Oregon does wolf count every winter. So in 2020, we had the count uh, for 2019 released. We are still waiting on the 2020 count to come out around April of this year. So in 2019, Oregon um, had at least 158 wolves, which marks a modest 15% increase um, since 2018. And we have 22 packs that are in 12 counties um, and 19 of them are, um, are considered breeding pairs. And there is a significance of that, which I will talk about in a minute. The mean pack size was, um, six, which is a pretty decent um, wolf pack size, I would say, um, not very uncommon um, to have smaller sizes. And um, for Oregon, a pack is defined as four or more individuals traveling together. So because we do winter count, that's when they assess this. That's why it's a winter uh, number. And B is that they assume that two of them are breeding pair and at least one or two yearlings. So somebody who survived a full year and not necessarily a pup. So that's how they count a pack in Oregon. Um, so how are wolves managed in Oregon? It looks a little bit complicated, but I'll walk you through it. Um, in Oregon, we have uh, divided the state into two management zones. The red line sort of defines um, the zones. 
Um, east of the red line is our east management zone and the west is the west management zone. And for each zone, um, the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife evaluates wolf population status and gives it phase ranking. So there are three management phases. We have phase one, which is at least uh, four or more breeding pairs for three consecutive years. And um, then we have phase two, which is kind of like an intermediate between phase one and phase three with no specific number designated to it. And phase three is reached when we have at least seven breeding pairs for three consecutive years. So if you look at Oregon, we have phase three applied to the East management zone because we do have almost 80% of our, or more than 80% of our wolf packs in Eastern Oregon. And then um, the West is still very much in phase one. Each zone marks more stringent laws. So phase one is the most conservative one and phase three is the most lenient one if you look at it as a gradation. So that's uh, where our state defines wolf management as. But what protections do wolves enjoy in Oregon in terms of uh, regulations? Oregon Endangered Species Act delisted wolves back in 2015. So they don't enjoy any state level protection at all since then. The one thing that they did have was the federal protection under the Federal Endangered Species Act until November of last year. So until then, uh, if you look at the map, the blue dotted line marks the federal boundary. So the western two thirds of our state was under federal listing and the eastern two th one third was already delisted in 2011 as a part of the Northern Rocky Mountain distinct population. So that's the population that covers Idaho, Wyoming, Montana and part of Eastern Oregon. So that part was already federally delisted prior. And the 2020 delisting means that the Western two thirds also do not have any protection. So as we stand right now, wolves do not have any federal or state endangered species protection uh, on them right now. Um, the recent delisting came about because of a March 2019 proposal by US Fish and Wildlife Service to delist the species based on the recovery rate in the greater lakes area. And while the Greater Lake area is seeing uh, some promising wolf recovery, but it is nowhere near an indicator of wolf recovery in the entire lower 48 states. Um, that is why we feel, feel very strongly that the delisting is premature and also not based in any scientific evidence. Uh, if you look at wolf suitable habitat map and look at historical range of wolves, wolves are nowhere near reaching that a range of their habitat um, reoccupation. Um, Colorado is a great example of that. Colorado is proportionately has the highest uh, amount of wolf suitable habitat, and yet they do not have any wolves yet. So that just shows that wolves have not recovered in the entire lower 48 states to have this delisting. And um, the general public did agree with us in the sense that if you look at all the public comments that came in uh, for the delisting, 97.5% of the public comments were not in favor of the delisting. And yet the last administration um, went ahead and moved the wolves out of the federal listing. And so now they're delisted. Um, so right now, the only protection that wolves have in Oregon or any recovery or management plan is determined by the Oregon Wolf Management Plan. And I'll talk about that briefly. So Oregon has a guiding document for wolf conservation and recovery in the state. And that's the Oregon uh, Wolf Conservation and Management Plan. We actually had a wolf conservation and management plan prior to wolves making it to Oregon because our first version of the plan came out in 2005. And it's supposed to be revised every five years, although the last iteration took um, nine years to come about simply because the stakeholders couldn't agree on some of the um, parameters that the plan defines. And I'll talk about those parameters now. So the wolf conservation and management plan basically outlines all guiding principles for when a wolf can be removed. And by removed, I mean killed. Um, and what defines chronic depredation standard? So chronic depredation is basically a wolf or a pack of wolf repeatedly uh, attacking livestock. So what de determines the definition of chronic is outlined in the plan. Again, we are not very uh, happy with what the plan states as chronic depredation standard. In phase one, it's four incidents in six months. And in phase three, 
it's two incidents in nine months. That's a very poor parameter because um, two incidents of anything in nine months is not chronic. You can, you can catch a cold twice in nine months and you will not say you're suffering from chronic cold. So that's a very bad measure of what chronic can be. Um, also, that document defines when Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife can either authorize themselves to kill wolf or pack of wolves, or they can give the permit to an affected landowner who can uh, kill a wolf because he was affected uh, because of livestock depredation. So again, that's a very um, slippery slope to go down uh, for us because uh, the fo focus of the plan seems to be much on management of wolves in terms of lethal control and less on non-lethal tools. The only provisions in the plan for non-lethal tool is um, in that they have made non-lethals as a requirement before resorting to lethal control during phase one. But that's not true for phase three. Everywhere else, non-lethal are a recommendation and not a requirement. So that leaves the door open to pretty much um, not wanting to do anything and everything being voluntary. So um, that's a, a huge concern for us, um, especially because lethal control is not effective in the long run. There is enough scientific evidence uh, to show that lethal control has very much unpredictable consequence on how wolves uh, or wolf packs react. Uh, for example, if you remove the breeder male of the pack, if you kill the breeder male of the pack, a new male will come in and you don't know what the hunting mechanism of that male is or whether he is even an efficient hunter. If you remove the breeder female, then um, the pack is most likely going to disperse into smaller units because um, all the other females in the pack are either siblings or daughters of the breeder male. So uh, he will not mate, which means the pack disperses and now you have more packs and which means they are likely to have other incidences as well. So it's a, it's a situation where the, the ground situation is very unpredictable. So lethal control is not effective. And yet we see a lot of focus, especially in phase three, on using lethal control as a management tool and not non-lethal tools. Um, so as defenders of wildlife, we are heavily focused on coexistence, um, both in terms of tools as well as in terms of policies. So with tools, um, I know uh, Samantha briefly touched upon this, but the same tools pretty much apply to other carnivores as well as it does to wolves. Um, for example, flagellary, the red strips that you see on the left. Um, those are basically kind of plastic metallic strips that make a very uh, crackling sound when, it, when the wind hits and it also generates sort of movement, which um, is a deterrent for wolves. Range riding is a, another very effective tool where a range rider basically um, rides across the entire rangeland uh, and hazes wolves if uh, they encounter one. Um, getting rid of attractants like um, carcass or bone piles is another good non-lethal tool. And the top right photo is basically burying of carcass um, in pits. And then livestock guardian dogs are also often used to um, deter wolves. So these are some of the more common tools. And sometimes we hear that, uh, oh, this tool is not effective in this context, or um, this tool does not really work. And that is largely because all of these tools are very situational dependent. So it depends on where and how you're using it. For example, flagellary is not good for open rangeland. It is good for a close pasture where you're housing calves. Um, you cannot have cost-effective flagellary for like a 30 mile range. Um, so, and again, same goes for range riding. Range riding is more effective when there are open range lands where the range rider can see quite far, whereas mountainous ranges where it's kind of hard to see uh, wide distances. So every tool's effectiveness is determined by the situation. And we would like the state agencies to focus on providing uh, producers with those tools and information so that they can make the best decision for themselves on what will work best on their ranges. But um, without those resources being diverted specifically for non lethals it becomes really a challenge for the, even the producers who are wanting to do the right thing to do the right thing and for us to be able to work with them. So those are certain things that we are trying to divert agencies toward. Um, as Samantha mentioned, we are working with wildlife services 
on uh, putting positions in Oregon that will focus on non-lethal specifically. And that would include wolves, of course, primarily on wolves. So they're supposed to help re uh, ranchers and also educate them on what non-lethal tools and techniques are available for them and also assist them in, in, in putting those up. So that's some of the non-lethal tools that uh, are out there. But what our long-term goal is actually to have a shift in behavior. And that would mean shift in our grazing practices and our animal husbandry practices. Uh, what do I mean by that? For example, one of the ranches we work in Montana have figured out a system where when their calves birth at the same time as elk do, they have synced up their birding cycle to meet, uh, match the natural birding season of elk. There's more elk calves out in the wild, which means wolves are less likely to come for the cattle because they already have easy prey on, natural prey on their landscape. So that has brought down their um, depredation rates significantly. That's one uh, change in the animal husbandry practice. Um, another one is the, a very common one is the bunching of cattle, as you see in the photo. Traditionally, or just evolutionarily, um, cattle tend to bunch up when they face threats, um, such as a predator. But over time, we have bred that trait out of the animal because uh, we use um, herding dogs. And if they bunch up, it's not effective. So we want them to run so that the dogs can chase them and herd them around. But that means that when a wolf chases them, they do the same. They run and they don't bunch up. Uh, when they bunch up like that, it's difficult for a predator like wolf to isolate one and get one. Uh, and that's a natural tendency of the animal to do, but we have not used that to the advantage. So that would again mean a shift in, in a, an animal husbandry practice that we have been doing. But to get there, we need to have, to, do, to have done the first steps, which is to build tolerance for ranchers to be able and willing to do these other bigger long-term changes in their practices because the ultimate goal is to build, um, as Hillary's quote here says, ranch resiliency. It's the ability to have a surviving and thriving business, knowing that there are predators on your landscape and they're going to stay on that landscape. So you cannot wipe out the species to um, make your business sustainable. You have to figure out how to live with it. And that would mean adapting your, uh, your practice as much as your landscape is adapting to the predator. So that's something that we are thriving or aiming for in the long term to bring that kind of a change in our um, animal husbandry practices. So that's what I wanted to share with you about wolves. And I will talk very briefly about um, another important species, um, but from a climate change perspective, and that's beavers, because we are the beaver state. So um, it's only fair we talk about beavers. And if you're wondering why I'm talking about beavers and predators, because that doesn't seem like a very linear connection for people to make, um, that's because of a policy hiccup more than the species trait, if you will. So why beavers and climate change? Um, because beavers are our natural allies against climate change impacts. They are uh, very efficient um, water engineers. And so through their work, they improve water quality, uh, improve stream restoration, they diversify habitat for other species, and they maintain and increase stream flows, uh, help us during a uh, flood season with uh, decreasing flood peaks and intensities. And I think the most recent one that kind of caught all of us was the wildfires and beavers are known to build moats that help mitigate wildfire spread. So there are our natural allies against dealing with several climate change impacts that we face um, and including protecting other species that are in peril too, such as salmon. So what is Oregon doing for beavers? Um, in very short manner, I would say not much um, in that we have very complicated beaver management policy in the state. Um, they, the status of beaver changes based on land ownership. So they are designated as predators on private lands. And what that means is that when an animal is designated as predators, their management is not on Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, but their management decisions are made by the legislature primarily, who directs Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife to do something. So, and why beavers in uh, predators? That's because 
all rodents or, or rodents in Oregon are classified as predators and um, beaver is a rodent and that's why it's a predator. So what, what having a predator status means is that ODFNW is not obligated by any means to monitor the population of beavers. Uh, there is no harvest or bag limits on private lands of how many beavers you can kill. Um, there is no tra trap check time limit um, that will generally apply for other uh, carnivores or other species. So we essentially don't know what the population of beavers in Oregon is. We do know that about 48,000 beavers have been killed since uh, in the last 12 years. Uh, but we don't know what, if that's even a sustainable limit. If, we're, if we are overexploiting, there is no information on that. So this legislative session, there is an attempt to change that. Um, there are two beaver specific bills going in. Um, House Bill 2844 is essentially attempting to change the predator status of beavers. Uh, that would mean moving their management over to Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife in which case they would have to have a, bon a population monitoring mechanism, have to have limits on harvest and um, killing of beavers and trap check times. So that would be really a great start to, uh, for beaver conservation in Oregon to have. The other bill, which is House Bill 2843, is attempting to um, ban trapping and hunting of beavers on federal public lands which would mean um, about half of the state's forested land is uh, federally uh, managed. So that would mean protecting that part of the state. So that's what has happened or not happened for beaver conservation so far. We hope that the state um, changes its policies towards predators in general and moves more towards a coexistence approach rather than kill and control. Um, whether we're talking at a state or a federal level or at a county level, um, these changes need to happen in all of these um, levels for us to see a meaningful change in how Oregon looks at uh, predators. So with that, um, I wrap up my part of the presentation and I'm happy to take questions that would be for me, Samantha or Haley. Great, thank you so much. And I just wanna say for the attendees, if you did join a little bit later, um, please feel free to enter any questions you have into the side chat. Um, we have about 20 minutes for questions. We do have a few that came through. The first question, um, aerial gutting seems egregious. How are they able to justify not only the price, but the overall disruption to the, wild, uh, to the wilderness areas? Is this in reference to wildlife services, I'm guessing, aerial gunning? Yes. Uh, yes, it is egregious. And um, yeah, I think that they are able to get away with it for so long because not enough people know about it. Um, wildlife services, like I said, is, is a program buried within the USDA. Um, and within the USDA, it's in the Animal Plant and Health Inspection Services uh, program. So it's housed within within the USDA. Um, and it's also hard to get uh, clear numbers from them. So we often have to do records requests, like I had mentioned, and those can take an extensive amount of time to get more information. Um, and even with aerial gunning, we learned through records requests that we have to ask specifically for aerial management plans in some states. Um, otherwise, they do not disclose uh, aerial gunning information. So. Um, it's just a lot of uh, loopholes and uh, things to have to kind of jump through to get uh, the full picture. And um, a lot of, we need to raise uh, more awareness around this because um, at $865 an hour, there's a lot of good we could do and a lot of good conservation work we could do instead. All right, another question. With feral cats being carnivores and a leading cause of bird death, is there anything we can do to regulate these cat populations? I can start and then Haley, maybe you, you wanna add something um, just because Guardians doesn't do a lot of domestic or invasive species uh, work. Um, but with feral cats, I, I think that there's a spay and release, you trap and spay and release, and there's several nonprofits that actually work on that. And that way the colonies uh, can't perpetuate. 
Um, and then there's also a uh, rehoming, uh, there's barn cat rehoming programs where feral cats um, from different feral colonies are placed in homes where they can do um, the free work that we mentioned coyotes uh, can do. Um, they can be free employees of a barn or farm and keep rodents away from uh, grain and feed. Uh, so those are a couple things. Haley, did I miss anything uh, maybe that the Humane Society is doing? Yeah, I think, you know, for the Humane Society of the United States, we work, you know, we work on um, protecting all animals and definitely feral cats, community cats um, are a big focus for our organization. And when it comes to wildlife, obviously it's, it's you know, a tough issue. Um, we, we care about those cats. We also care about the wildlife. And so it's kind of like, what, what can we do that's best for all animals involved? And I really think that um, trap neuter release programs or TNR programs are the best option um, because that's a, a really great way to reduce the colony um, and, and prevent, you know, future breeding. Um, whereas just removing those cats in the first place, it's like with cougars, if you remove those cats, you're just going to see an influx of more cats. Removing those cats doesn't solve the problem. Um, but TNR programs are a really great way to gradually reduce the colony. Um, and I will say HSUS, one of our big, um, big focuses is, you know, building coalitions to do that. It can't just be like one local humane society or just a couple of volunteers on the ground. It needs to be a coalition effort of, you know, local groups, local volunteers, state organizations, um, even federal. If, if, you know, if you have USDA Wildlife Services wants to do non-lethal feral cat work, then, you know, maybe, maybe there's a place for them too in that. But um, yeah, it's definitely TNR programs are, are the most effective. Great. Um, another question. Can you speak to the risk of forcing carnivores out of their native habitats through deforestation or other human activities and the effect that might have on human carnivore interactions in the future? Sristi, you want to start? Sure, I feel like it's a broad question which all of us could briefly maybe touch upon. But um, I think the most obvious one that happens with um, habitat degradation or forest degradation or loss is simply habitat loss for the species, which means you are pushing a population that had an X amount of space now into half or whatever less percentage of space you have. And um, that just means more interaction between their species. So for example, for wolves, that would complicate matters because they're very territorial about their area. So uh, bringing two packs together means conflict amongst themselves too. And then restricting their space in terms of forest degradation means also loss of prey, which means then you are definitely increasing the possibility or probability of human or wolf livestock interaction or carnivore livestock interaction, which is something that is definitely not any of us are desiring. We want more prey population for um, the carnivores so that they can have their natural sources of food. Um, but limiting um, the geographical space for them to be able to move and find food from other sources or being able to sustain a population that's healthy for them to be able to feed, breed, and disperse uh, becomes far more complicated with loss of habitat. Um, and anybody else would like to add on? Yeah, you know, I think, I think that's right on point. Um, and we're seeing, you know, human development further and further into our remaining wild spaces. Um, and that's not just here in Oregon or the Pacific Northwest, that's everywhere. Um, and I, I think it's, you know, it's, finding ways to protect that habitat um, through things like conservation easements, um, you know, wildlife corridors, preserving those landscapes and, and protecting them for the long term, um, doing things like habitat crossings. So there's, you know, safe places, safe passageways for these animals to move across um, freeways. But it's also on the members of, of a community that are um, moving near our wild spaces and um, changing the narrative. Um, you have people moving into places like Bend, Oregon, or, um, you know, Sun River, um, Boulder, Colorado, where maybe they didn't live near native carnivores before. Now they do. 
and they're not entirely sure how to, to um, you know, prevent conflicts from happening or what to do if, if they do see a bobcat or a mountain lion when they're out on the trail. And so I think it's really important to have that public component. And that's one of the, the things that I touched on in, in my panel is, you know, it, it's really important for wildlife agencies to try and stay on top of that narrative and kind of push back on, on media comments where people might seem fearful of these animals instead of, you know, perpetuating that fear, which is really unnecessary and just does more harm than good. We should be providing people with, with basic understanding of the animals that live in these spaces. Um, you know, when they're, what hours they're active, you know, don't leave your, your dog out in your backyard unsupervised during dusk or dawn. Um, you know, implementing tools and strategies in your own communities that prevent conflicts from happening in the first place. One example that I really love is Steamboat Springs in Colorado. It's Northern Colorado. It's this beautiful mountain town. If you've ever been there, you know, it's just gorgeous. And there are wildlife all around, including mountain lions. Um, there are bears, there are meso carnivores. And so the community is, is actually working on implementing um, over time, this gradual um, implementation of wildlife proof trash cans and making it like a county ordinance so that everybody uses these. Um, it's not just, you know, one neighbor using them. It has to be everybody. It has to be a community solution. Um, and so funding is really important for that. And, you know, definitely <laughs> places that don't have the funds to do that, you know, we need to be helping them find solutions to get access to those tools and to know how to use them properly. Yeah, and I, I'll add a pretty simple three-pronged approach that we look at with conflict. It's how do we eliminate the deterrent or the attractants? So bird seed, even in a yard, starts bringing other animals around. You start going up the food chain from there. Um, hummingbird feeders, uh, your own waste and your own trash. Uh, those are all attractants. Um, then how do we implement deterrence? And that's stuff like Sristi talked about, the flagery, um, having human presence or range riding. Um, some people even in urban areas have coyote fencing with rollers on top so coyotes can't get into their yard if they have small dogs. Um, those dog protection uh, collars and vests that you see. Um, and then lastly, it's the, the interventions and those are more aggressive that can be hazing um, all the way to um, when lethal um, is used and it should be used very rarely. And <laughs> if at all, I'm sure we could have a robust conversation around that. But using those three uh, elements, it's really a good way to address conflict, even from a suburban backyard to a grazing allotment. And uh, that's a great way to start addressing conflict um, on any level you're working at. Oh, I think I would, ju I just wanted to wrap up the thought here because I think what we all essentially see or face in our work, and I'm speaking more at the like a state policy level here, is that there needs to be a shift in understanding wildlife as a commodity to being a, a natural resource. The only opportunity that we can have to having a sustainable carnivore population um, is to not look at it as when can we start shooting it. Um, so that's the shift that needs to happen and that has not happened. So when we're talking about forest degradation and we talk about loss of prey and therefore loss of habitat and loss of, uh, of the predator too, it's ultimately that we are killing both the prey and the predator, but for different reasons. We're not letting the natural interaction between the two happen because we have vested interest either in having the prey to hunt for ourselves and not having the predator to you know, uh, prey on our livestock. But the natural interaction is getting lost in the process. And so, when we don't address those issues and still look at every species as a commodity we're managing so that we can make money out of it, um, is, is going to be a very tough challenge to bring that change. So that, that change in our state policy, we see small bits of hope there, but it's it's a long way to go still. Yeah, and, and federally, I have one last thing. Gosh, we could talk about this all day. <laughs> and federally um, too, if we're looking at that deforestation, that makes public land all the more important, right? That uh, 
people are permitted to graze livestock on Forest Service land and on BLM lands and on state lands um, in most states, if not all, all states. Um, so it's really how do we preserve the integrity of public lands too? Um, and that might be how do we adjust grazing practices if folks are only paying a dollar thirty-five per cow calf pair, you know, for grazing season. Um, is that really offsetting the cost to our environment um, from having cattle out there? So all big issues to tackle um, going forward. And then Haley, these next two questions are specifically addressed to you. So I'll just put them together. They're both short. Um, the first question is, do you know of any non-lethal community-based programs that have been successful in your view? And the second is, if the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife allows killing of one third of cougars in Oregon, how many are actually killed? Yeah, those are both great questions. Um, I'll, I'll answer the, the second one first. Um, so I, I think annually um, about 200 or so, it, it ships every year, but about 200 or so are uh, cougars are trophy hunted in Oregon. Um, I think it, it's actually has been a little bit higher, maybe towards 300 in, in the last couple of years. I'd have to take a look at my my um, my spreadsheet. Um, but you know, it, it's it's definitely not near that 900 cougar quota. Um, but then you add other sources of mortality like for livestock depredation um, or in the target zone killing, um, you know, there, there are hundreds more cougars that are killed every year. Um, and so when all of those numbers add up, a lot of those numbers aren't taken into account, um, but they all add up to more, a, large, a large portion of mortality. So it's, it's about taking a look at all of the sources of mortality, not just the trophy hunting numbers. Um, and, and I will say, you know, one of the things that HSUS really pushes back on when it comes to hunting of, uh, of cougars is that, you know, when a female cougar is trophy hunted, oftentimes she'll have kittens um, it, who she'll leave them in her den um, in, to go forage for food, to go find prey. Um, for her kittens. And so oftentimes a female will be killed um, for trophy hunting or predator control purposes. And then her kittens are left to die without their mother. Um, you know, they die from things like starvation or predation um, or just exposure to the elements. And so that's a, that's a big thing for HSUS. Those numbers are totally unrecorded. Um, the, the number of kittens in Oregon um, for cougars, those there's no estimate, um, real estimate for the number of kittens in Oregon. It's more just a guesstimate, um, but, but the number of cougars that are actually killed, we can't get hard numbers for those because it doesn't include those kitten mortalities. Um, so for the second question, um, examples of non-lethals in um, communities, you know, I think the Steamboat Springs one is a really great example. Um, you see, you see little bits and pieces from different communities based on the issues that they're having and the resources that they have available to them. Um, so I think Bend um, is is really great. They um, they're really taking more of a community based approach where you know they're they're just getting more public education out so people feel more comfortable with animals. Um, I don't, I'm not sure that they've actually implemented non-lethal strategies or tools in different communities in Bend, but they're at least getting those public education components out there. Um, Boulder, Colorado is another great one where it really has been about the public education, um, you know, and not just killing an animal on site for coming into the community but hazing that animal to get them away if needed, or even just letting that animal leave on their own. Um, it's more about the mindset of the community and just you know, changing the philosophy of how they see these animals and how they, they address um, the animal entering that community. Um, but you know, a lot of communities implement things like wildlife proof trash cans. If you ever go to Lake Tahoe, 
the entire area of Lake Tahoe, everybody has, you know, these, these um, large metal uh, bins that you keep your trash can enclosed in. Um, and so, so like I said, it's that community approach where everybody's engaged, everybody's involved, and everybody has a vested interest in protecting the wildlife. Thank you for that. I think we have time. We're going to squeeze in hopefully two more questions. This one, um, I'm pretty sure all three of you touched on. The question is, do you think Biden's administration will relist wolves or will consider it? I can kickstart and um, you guys can jump in too. So, um, I mean, we are hopeful, but there is a process to it. So that's what we are waiting to see unfold. Um, at a federal level, a group of conservation organizations have filed a federal lawsuit, Defenders being one of them, and there are many others. And we are basically asking US Fish and Wildlife Service to reconsider the decision based on the fact that there wasn't enough um, scientific evidence to back their decision and that public opinion was also not in favor of this decision. So that court proceeding is underway. Um, that said that, uh, I mean, this administration is new and they are definitely way more environmentally progressive than the last one. So um, there are conversations um, that can be had and are being had. There is no direct indication that the administration is going to do anything right away, but that said, um, through US Fish and Wildlife Service and the changes within that particular agency, we are hopeful that they will reconsider their decision this year and uh, we'll see how the case uh, plays out at a federal level there. Yeah, I think you covered it, Sristi, that we're, we're kind of waiting um, for the case to pan out. And I think that unfortunately we were able to see what happened really in the Great Lakes states um, over the past couple of weeks with Wisconsin's uh, really horrific, what, 48, 72 hours um, of killing 216 wolves. Um, and even Adrian Trevis has been reviewing kind of the population numbers and he is estimating it could have a long-term impact of over 40% really in that state because of um, breeding offsets and stuff. So there's a lot uh, going on there. So hopefully we can keep pushing that forward with this administration, um, both in legal and policy means um, through both routes. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think we're just remaining hopeful and, um, you know, supporting this administration as much as we can and providing them resources as needed. Um, and, you know, trying to stay optimistic and hopeful um, as we move forward. But yeah, as we've seen in the Great Lakes, um, it, it's just been horrific. And I think it's a really great example that that will still really need federal protections. Um, we cannot be leaving it in the hands of states that are just rushing to open up a trophy hunt. And one final question, we have a few more minutes. Are there any cash incentives also considered for ranchers who use lethal methods because they are the easiest? Um, would you mind repeating that question, Michelle? Is it cash incentive for lethals or non-lethals? The question says lethal. Okay. Um, no. So right now in Oregon, according to the wolf management plan, you cannot make money from a, a wolf. So even if a wolf is killed under or ODFW's uh, lethal control permit, you cannot sell the hide or any part of the wolf in any manner and make money out of it. So you have to hand it over to the agency and the agency manages or maintains um, the, the animal itself. So there is no money or cash incentive right now, uh, but that's the part where we um, are constantly negotiating with each round of the wolf management Plan because there is a constant push to open um, what is called control take. Um, and control take is basically one way of saying hunting uh, because the difference between lethal control and control take is that lethal control is in, is in response of chronic depredation and control take is basically taking a wolf for a set number. So like uh, uh, in a year, seven wolves can be taken and you can get licenses or permits to do that. So that's basically opening up hunting. So right now we have pushed back on control day, uh, but there is language in the plan where in phase three, that could be an option. And um, 
I think uh, it's not prescribed in the plan yet, but if control take were to be uh, executed, then um, I, I think the animal is not prescribed to be handed back to ODFMW, in which case there is money element as associated with that. I can talk to you about, uh, with wildlife services, I would say the incentive there to, to work with them is uh, the, the cost of their work is really offset by taxpayer dollars. So that's why um, we often get producers turning to them um, that, and they've been there for almost a century now um, when producers have had conflict with wildlife. Um, and that's why the reform is so important, right? Because they're going to turn to a source they know and a source that's uh, the costs are offset. Um, and on the non-lethal side, we've also seen some, some financial incentives there too. So I would say there's two sides of the coin um, and that's why it's so important to reform wildlife services. Thank you for mentioning that. The um, asker of the question did mean clarified and did mean non-lethal. So thanks for touching on that. Okay. Um. I can definitely add to that too. So there is um, cash incentive in the sense, um, there's no direct cash payout, but we have an Oregon Wolf Compensation Fund that is administered under Oregon Department of Agriculture. And that uh, fund basically is a compensation program for either direct loss of livestock from depredation uh, what is called indirect loss of livestock, which is like missing livestock um, or a loss of livestock guardian dogs. Those things are compensated. And uh, Defenders was part of the initial group that built into this statute. Uh, this is now a law in Oregon. And in that law, we wrote that at least 30% of the fund has to be used for non-lethals. So uh, every county has a wolf compensation committee. And the com committee sort of administers this fund. They receive applications. As a landowner, you can apply saying that I have this much pasture and I need to do flaggery, for example, and I need this much money for it. Um, the cycle of payment is a little bit wacky in Oregon. So the, you actually get reimbursed rather than getting paid before. But there is a payment plan uh, that covers things like flaggery, range riding, um, other tools, uh, rag boxes, fox lights, all of that are covered. And so, so far, ODFNW, oh, sorry, Oregon Department of Agriculture, ODA has been giving almost 40% of the fund uh, for non lethals So there is cash incentive in that sense. Yeah, and that's something we see in different uh, state legislators too, um, really across the West, at least where um, I work, is that we see these legislatures kind of um, giving the Department of Agriculture funding. Um, this, a similar program happens in Washington. Um, and then again, there's also a lot of nonprofits that are um, willing and open to doing technical work um, to assisting. So if there's any, ever anyone you know that has an issue, definitely connect them with us and we can get you in the right direction. Um, but there are nonprofits out there that will offset uh, costs of non-lethals too. Absolutely. Yeah, Defenders covers, Range Riders, um, Flaggery, all of that. Um, in Eastern Oregon, we work with ranchers in Wallawa County and Baker County on those um, and are trying to also start working in Southwest Oregon the same. It's basically we provide them with the tools and provide trainings and workshops so that we're trying to basically minimize the extent of cost that landowners have to bear. But I think here the main issue is actually the change of attitude, um, meaning simply a landowner's willingness to work with us. All right, well, I We've accidentally gone over three minutes from our time, but um, Sam, Haley, and Tristy, thank you so much for being willing to present and have these conversations with us. They're super important. Um, this does conclude the panel. Everybody, thank you for attending. Um, tonight, there is a panel over on our Zoom account. You can get to that link through our Facebook page, um, and that will be on protecting old growth forests. Thank you all again. Thank, thank you. you so